Welcome to everyone and to our speakers. Thank you for making the time to discuss this important topic. Welcome everyone. This webinar is available in two languages, in Bahasa and in English. In your webinar controls, click inter interpretation, then click the language that you'd like to hear. To hear Bahasa, please make sure you click Japanese. We don't have a Bahasa option, so to hear Bahasa, click the option Japanese. To hear the imprinted language only, click mute original audio. And then if you want to go to uh, hear the original audio, just go to unmute original audio. This webinar is, uh, is one of the webinars in a series of such uh, as part of the new initiative of IAA Inclusive Urban Sanitation. There's a link on this slide that you can find more information about the initiative and there's also a QR code that you can scan to get to the page. There will be more information that will be posted on the webinar chat. <laughs> This event will be recorded and made available on demand on the IWA website with presentation slides and other information. The speakers are responsible for securing copyright permissions for any work that they will present on which they are not the legal copyright holders. And the opinions, hypotheses, conclusions, or recommendations contained in the presentation and other materials are the sole responsibility of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the IWA opinion. We have chat box where you can please use this for general requests and for interactive activities. And if you have questions for our panelists, please put those in the Q&A box. We'll answer those questions during the discussions. Uh, we have a special Q&A sessions uh, towards the end of the webinar. And uh, attendees' micro microphones are muted and unfortunately we cannot respond to the option raise hand. This is the agenda for our webinar today, which is going to start with um, housekeeping rules, which I'm just doing, uh, why inclusive uh, inclusion matters. And we have few polls um, over the webinar. We have three presentations to be made and four panelists uh, that will be able to answer your questions. Once again, for whoever um, hasn't heard, uh, and hasn't joined in the very beginning. The webinar is available in two languages, Bahasa and English. Uh, please go to the webinar controls click and click the option interpretation. Click the language that you'd like to hit. Um, if you want to hear Bahasa, select Japanese. And to hear in the interpreted language only, please mute original audio. Just a little bit of background on the webinar. Globally, there's a growing attention and recognition of the need of water and sanitation organizations to improve their attention to gender, diversity, and equity. This webinar represents a collaboration between Water for Women, International Water Association, and World Bank Equal Aqua. Water for Women is a multi-country fund supporting inclusive water sanitation and hygiene in Asia and the Pacific. University of Technology, Sydney, has led several collaborative research grants under this fund, including one focused on gender equality in water and sanitation partnerships, workforce and impact measurements. International Water Association is a member network for leading water and sanitation professionals in science, research, technology, and practice. There are at least 10,000 individual and 400 corporate members spread across over 130 countries. World Bank Equal Aqua is a collaborative platform that aims to deepen the dialogue on gender diversity and inclusion in the water sector. Uh, convening different actor and benchmarking gender inclusion in water organizations. Together, we are all working towards a common goal to make a more inclusive gender equal sector that support diverse people to thrive and contribute to water and sanitation workplaces and the services they provide to broader society. Effort in this area is much needed. A recent World Bank report highlighted that on average women represent less than 18% of the utilities workforce. Less than one in four managers and engineers in water utilities are female. Moreover, female in engineers leave utilities at nearly twice the rate of their male counterpart. In order to find out what is the current status of your uh, institution in terms of gender equality and diverse diversity, I would like to invite you for the first poll. 
We have two questions here. I invite all the participants in the webinar to answer those questions. Uh, first of them is how gender equal is your organization just now? You have few options here, very gender equal, somewhat gender equal, not very equal, and not at all gender equal. And there's a second question, how diverse is your organizational workforce in terms of ethnicity, disability, and other protected characteristics? Very diverse, a little diverse, not very diverse, not at all diverse. You have probably a couple of minutes for those. Please do put your answers. I'm very curious to learn what is the current status in terms of diversity of your own institution. Also for all participants, it will be great if you put in the chat box um, who you are and what is your institution. So we know uh, who we have here. Just a quick hello from everyone will be great. You're all welcome to list yourself in the chat box. So I believe most of our attendees have voted. Uh, it looks like the results are pretty much we are in the middle of the scale. Uh, how gender equal is your organization just now? Uh, 46th of the attendees uh, answered somewhat gender equal, which is still positive. Unfortunately, we have 24% of not very gender equal and also 5% of not at all gender equal. So um, I'm absolutely happy that we have these people here and hopefully will contribute to changes to start in your institutions. In terms of how diverse is your organizational workforce, uh, pretty much the same status, uh, a little diverse. Uh, luckily, we have 32% uh, of uh, attendees that answer very diverse, that's very positive. But unfortunately, not very diverse is 19% of the answers and not at all diverse has, has voted. Speakers, uh, we have three speakers and a panel conversation with an additional four speakers. I'll introduce our speakers just now. Annabelle Waitutu is a director of programs at Big Five Africa LTD. She brings us distinguished 20 years career in the water and environment sector in East South Africa, particularly in water sector reforms, gender equality, mainstreaming and climate resilience. Ms. Waititu has consulted for leading sector initiatives, including the Kenya water sector reforms, water for Africa cities, the Lake Victoria water and sanitation training and capacity building program, the World Bank WASI program, and USAID, among others. She's a member of uh, the investment committee with Kenya Innovation Finance for Water, a board mem member with Sanivation, and a fellow of the Center for Governance and Sustainability at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Annabelle will share her journey to reach a leadership position and her observation on imbalance in water and sanitation workforce and, uh, and limited inclusion in her country and region. Our second speaker will be Julie Paspasari. She is a head of diversity of non-revenue uh, water distribution, Tirta Sanjivani Gyanai. Excuse me, Julie, if I don't pronounce it right, from Bali, Indonesia. Julie has uh, over 14 years of experience in the water and sanitation sector and an extensive experience for Jet Sea mainstreaming through various learning programs and certifications. Uh, Julie has supported her utility to make significant advances in the area of gender equality and inclusion. Our third speaker is Professor Juliet Willits, uh, who is research director at Institutes of Sustainable futures and a recognized global expert in applied research in water and sanitation in Asia and the Pacific. She has a particular interest and passion for gender equality in the water sector and has been working in gender related research guidance and tools for more than a decade. Juliet will describe recent research on barriers and strategies for an inclusive workforce, work workplaces across different stages of employment. Uh, we'll also have an uh, additional panelist when we have to the, get to the panel conversation. Mrs. Diane, Diana Makwaba will be joining the panel. She's a managing director at the NAC, uh, at the Nkana Water Supply and Sanitation Company, LTG, in Kitwe, Zambia, which is a water utility serving a customer base of over 70,000 on the Copper Belt province of Zambia. 
She became the first female chief executive officer among 11 water utilities in Zambia and was recognized by the, by the Zambia Utility Regulator, National Water Supply and Sanitation Council, uh, as the best chief executive officer among water utilities for 2018 and 2020. And Kana Water and recogni uh, was recognized as best water utility for 2020. She, she has over 20 years work experience and 16 years being as, at executive management level. I would now, now like to welcome Annabelle. Annabelle will share with us her experience of shifting norms of perception to reach a leadership position. Over to you, Annabelle. So thank you. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Saika. Great. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you, Saika. Yeah. Thank you, Iowa team, for the opportunity to present my experience in the world. I would like to start by uh, probably just, uh, you know, looking at that first slide that is, uh, uh, provides a situation analysis. And I want to start by emphasizing or echoing what the findings of so many have been that are uh, uh, women face multiple barriers in getting to and performing their leadership roles in the wash sector. And that is because it is always seen as a technical sector and it is said that women are not technical. So it is not always very easy for women to get into the sector. So these barriers many times force women out of the race and enable men to occupy most senior leadership um, decision-making positions. And does not only start when you're working, it also starts uh, as early as you're going to school and also as you're going to college. So in a study that we conducted in 2019 and 2020 on behalf of WhatsApp, WhatsApp is water and sanitation for the urban poor, uh, whose uh, purpose was to identify the barriers that women face in attending and holding, in attaining and holding decision-making roles in the water and sanitation sector. Um, uh, uh, we found out that uh, um, that women globally in technical and leadership roles face lower wages. Um, they face gender-based discrimination and sexual harassment. Um, and 29% of what we found out globally from the literature is that 29% uh, have been treated as incompetent, and that is only because of their gender. 55% of women in senior leadership in STEM uh, report sexual harassment. Uh, and 18% have received less support from their senior leadership uh, than men in the same uh, job positions. And 29% in the STEM and less than men in the same uh, job positions. That is just basically to show uh, the situation as we found it. And uh, we went ahead and we were conducting, maybe go to the next slide. So in terms of representation in the Kenyan water sector, we looked at six uh, public institutions and out of the, um, the 4,114 full-time workers employed in the six organizations, only 1,468, and that is about 35.6% uh, are women or were women at that point. The study identified that uh, women face the following barriers. So it's mainly education barriers, and that is because of the perception of STEM uh, courses, which are seen mainly as uh, male dominated, but there are also quite a number of institutional barriers that included you know, the lack of gender policies to support uh, uh, you know, gender equality programs. They also find, uh, we also found out that there are quite, there's quite a bit of exclusion from social or informal networks that hinder women from actually uh, succeeding when they are invited for interviews uh, because some of the um, findings revealed that uh, some decisions are not just made in the boardroom, they are made way before. And then there was also lack of transparency in recruitment and also in promotion processes. And that is because the sector favors uh, men more compared to women. So social cultural barriers were also uh, a key factor, and that has a lot to do with the perceptions, stereotypes, and biases regarding the jobs in the water, in the water and sanitation sector. Next slide. So uh, in terms of uh, looking at what we found out in terms of uh, male-female representation, uh, we found that, um, that out of uh, in all those uh, institutions, 
there was only one uh, institution and that is um, uh, KEWI, that is Kenya, uh, Kenya Water Institute, which is a research institution in Kenya, that it is the only one that had a, a, over 50% female representation in the, in the board. But as you can see in the management, it was uh, very low because it was only at 20%. Uh, and uh, from that, you'll also see that uh, it's only for organizations out of the seats that had attained the 30%, which is the minimum requirement in Kenya for gender or, you know, for, for gender representation. That is either women or men, at least 30%. So it's only, it's only, um, it's only you know, four out of uh, those organizations had not attained that. So in terms of like what we found out even in this situation that uh, especially for the boards, um, majority of the times those boards are mainly political awardees that are given those positions. And so what happens is that uh, women getting to the positions of leadership still is a big problem unless you are awarded you know, politically. And that is uh, also because of what you have talked about that you know women hardly get to those positions because uh, of the processes that tend to exclude them. So, uh, so I'll share my own situation in my effort to grow my career as a leader in a male-led and male-dominated sector. There has been a number of barriers and obstacles that I have faced that include um, uh, what you have over there in this uh, slide. Uh, some of them are negative attitudes and perceptions towards women leadership. And myself personally, I faced that. I was very excited when I started growing up in my, growing in my career in, in the sector, but also in international development. I started by being a coordinator to the NGO, um, uh, to, to the NGO group that was um, mandated by the UN to consolidate the input into the high level policy documents. And um, as I was leading quite a number of organizations that were NGOs, and most of them were led and headed by men. And um, you know, I was performing quite well. And my boss who was a female um, was very generous with, um, you know, like uh, just letting, you know, letting me know how I was performing all the time and congratulating me. And as I was leading, I was getting excited and I was, um, getting my confidence growing, growing uh, day by day. But as, um, as I continued in this position, because it had a lot of uh, power and a lot of authority in terms of how we, we consolidated our input into the international decision-making processes, I began to attract a lot of opposition and intimidation, especially from uh, the organization heads who are mostly men. And they looked at me as young and not experienced because those days then I was trying to, you know, just getting myself into the area, which I, I did quite well. Uh, so, and, and of course the intimidation was quite, uh, you know, rampant because every time then we'd go to the meeting that I'm told how, how inexperienced I was and so I should, see my, my possession. And majority of the times when I said the requirements for what is needed for, for, for us to be able to you know, work with the organization, then it was also translated to be intimidation and, and um, arrogance. It was also said to be bullying. And so I found myself in a very tight position because then I wasn't uh, very sure exactly how to, to move, to, you know, to, to, to sort of deal with that at that point. So basically what happened is that I kept on feeling like uh, every time because of the intimidation that I was going through, that I needed to assert myself and sort of confirm to everyone that, you know what, we are capable of the job, my organization is capable. So it's like you always want to assert yourself because of what you are going through. And that is one thing that I learned from that whole process is that um, when you're too confident, uh, instead of attracting support, at times you, you attract uh, opposition. And uh, then I discovered that uh, even as much as I tried to see what kind of leadership style I needed to, 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 to pick up, I discovered that uh, the more soft, uh, if you become soft, then you're also considered to be incompetent. So when you're incompetent, it's, it's said that um, you know, you're arrogant. So basically it was very difficult, but I also met quite a number of biases and stereotypes that hindered me from growing in my career. And majority of the times is that uh, when you became firm and stood firm, I remember one time uh, in, in a board meeting 
when I responded in a very firm, in a very firm manner to um, Secretary General who was intimidating the, the board members, um, in majority of the times uh, you come out and people want to co congratulate you but commend you in a way that it was a bit intimidating, it's stereotypical. I, I remember that one time I, I, I stepped in because there was a lot of, um, you know, crash, opposition, and uh, conflict that was uh, emerging in the in the board. And when I stepped in, and uh, we were able to resolve and sort out the problem, um, there was one gentleman who was actually the chair of the board, and he came to me directly and he told me, "Oh, congratulations! You did very well. You are, you are our Mother Karoa." And uh, of course, in Kenya, if you say Mother Karoa, Mother Karoa was a very strong political um, political female. Uh, female who supported the government when there was such a, you know, there was a major conflict. And so when, when people started interpreting what her characteristic was, she was said to be arrogant, and she was also told to be proud and disrespectful of men. And so when he said that you are our mother Karoa, I actually thought, even though he was commending me, that kind of stereotypical uh, perception of women then was actually not uh, welcome. Instead of helping you to grow in your career, you feel like you want to, um, you actually get discouraged. And at this point, because of all this, uh, my personal frames, which is basically the beliefs and perceptions that I held as I was growing up, they started haunting me and holding me back. And um, I started looking at the socially endorsed views uh, that sort of shape uh, female leadership. And I started discrediting my leadership abilities. And I started abandoning some of the aspirations that I had as a leader. And that is basically how then this, this, this um, affected me. The other thing, of course, is uh, the leadership uh, style. I embrace uh, a relational uh, leadership uh, style and majority of the times is also uh, misconceived to be a weakness. Um, because majority of people see like it, it takes a lot of time. Uh, majority of people say that, you know, you don't have to be consulting all the time. I mean, you can make a decision. So when you don't make a decision and you want to do more consultations, then it is also uh, um, perceived to be a weakness. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Of course, uh, the, the next aspect is... Uh, uh, family or family obligations. And of course, uh, when you have family obligations and you're looking for a, for a, for a transfer or a change of job, uh, you realize that uh, they, they start, um, you, know, you start getting um, you know, a different attitude from your bosses. So at one point I actually lost my job because I said I can't travel anymore. So I think um, uh, basically the, the challenges that I found myself facing is that, uh, you know, as I was growing in, in leadership, and especially in the water sector, I also discovered that uh, we don't have enough female leadership networks. And it is not until I came across Jeddah and Water Alliance and uh, WOKAN, WOKAN, which is Women Organizing for Change in Agriculture and Natural Resource Management, there were no networks before, but uh, joining then uh, Gender and Water Alliance and WOKAN, then I realized that uh, we, we had adequate networks because those are the kind of uh, networks that brought a number of um, uh, you know, um, senior females in the water sector. And so we were able to, to address. And so it's the same thing with the mentorship, which is also an issue. But again, I want to I just talk a little bit about the aspect of uh, uh, sexual harassment, which is very rampant. And especially when it comes to senior males in some of those organizations, and uh, you find yourself, um, you know, always getting sexually harassed. So, and, and I remember that one time when I was selected to support the government to negotiate in the Ramsar Convention, very senior officials started harassing, started harassing me and also the other women who are with us who are very few, and because you always find yourself very few, it becomes very, very difficult for you to know exactly how to, you know, to, to deal with it, especially when you have to have very senior uh, 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 leaders uh, doing this. So if you go to the uh, next slide, I'll just talk a little bit about how I overcame some of these barriers at my own individual level. One, um, one aspect was the self-awareness. And which is, I, I like to say that uh, self-awareness is a very solid foundation for effective leadership. Um, 
because then you don't have to always keep on fearing uh, about backlash. You know, that is what keeps people from actually getting to be firm. So when you become self-aware, then you, you know, th th this aspect of always wanting to, you know, li like to look good then disappears. You want to do the right thing. So I, I joined uh, gender and leadership trainings, which were very helpful. And then I started learning how to confront the cultural barriers, uh, which of course uh, grew my, my, my self-confidence. And I started becoming very clear about the things that I did not, uh, I did not condone. And uh, I started making very firm decisions without uh, fearing backlash. And of course, confronting openly sexual harassment, being very deliberate also in terms of seeing how we can be able to help other people who I thought would be doing this. I confronted it, but then I also started introducing it in all the programs, including the negotiation programs. We started bringing it out and talking about sexual harassment and seeing that it was going to interfere with how effective we are likely to become when we are going to attend like international meetings and want to negotiate. So we said that, uh, you know, so, so then everybody started becoming aware and everybody started talking about it. So it was no longer like, um, it was no longer hidden. So if anybody did it, then it came out openly because then we were confronting it. So and I designed uh, capacity building uh, programs and trainings that were geared towards uh, breaking uh, these programs. And that is how then I finally embarked on influencing change through trainings and capacity building. And because I was working in the water sector, working more with the water utilities, where I also found out through uh, gender analysis that this was rampant, but there was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, people were quiet. They were not able to do, you know, like uh, to confront it because of lack of um, uh, tools and instruments that would support uh, this kind of uh, challenges. So we started on capacity building uh, programs that aimed at transforming the mainstream. And um, we started influencing change. And uh, the, the, the trainings uh, aimed at confronting the unconscious or uh, unconscious biases through awareness, but also enabling men and women, you know, to transform in the way uh, they, they, in, in what they were doing. And for example, one of the uh, aspects that we were doing is to look at women and encouraging them and mentoring them. So we started programs that were mentoring women in the workplaces and designed and implemented targeted interventions. So that going beyond training and in line with the individual and institutional needs, we started introducing programs. And what you can see here, this woman, she's, um, you know, she, she was uh, doing administrative work, but uh, we worked with the organization so that she can be able to get into the uh, technical work. So before then, it was always said that uh, because women do not, don't ride motorbikes, we cannot employ them to do like, for example, line patrols. And so we said, okay, uh, we can actually introduce uh, this uh, riding of the bicycles, but without encouraging women and enabling them to see that they can actually overcome this barrier, then it wouldn't work. So we started working on influencing change, both within the institutions, but also in the mindsets of, uh, of females. And the next slide, we, we, we focused a lot on networking and communicating. And this is what, what you can see over here is um, one of the women plumbers who actually was thriving in this sector after a lot of mentoring and support. And uh, we decided, why don't we also get it captured in, uh, uh, in the media? So we started thinking of how do we um, mobilize the media so that the media can also become part of this whole process. So also mobilizing male support, you know, uh, and especially looking at the MDs and the team leaders in different departments to support women to be able to take up uh, the different uh, jobs that initially women could not, uh, could not do. And then in, in this capacity building, we talked a lot about the need to, to reframe leadership for gender equality. And this is why you think about what is that alternative uh, relational uh, leadership that should be introduced so that it can also be supportive to both men and women. And so, um, the, the purpose of this uh, leadership, uh, reframing leadership training was to provide men and women uh, with an opportunity to reflect upon and to challenge the traditional notions of leadership within their organizations and their own personal 
uh, lives. So we introduced uh, that and uh, and quite a number of um, yeah, you know, a, a number of leaders then began to see that this was uh, that, that this was actually working, and that is how then in a number of organizations, quite a number of things changed, changed like uh, the institutional environment. There was a conducive work environment, inclusive and gender responsive uh, work programs and policies began to change, and that is why above there then we were showing that uh, you want to make sure that when someone is actually going to complain about about sexual harassment then uh, you actually get someone who can respond to that. And so finally, just to say that uh, what can be done to improve uh, the next generation of women is basically just to help them grow uh, their self-image, uh, the self-awareness, provide networks that support, that provide tangible support. Uh, like for example, what you are fighting with Gender and Water Alliance and WOKAN and mentorship programs and mobilize male support, which is quite critical. Uh, for, for, for both men and women so that they can be able to see how they can advocate for women leadership and want the involvement of both men and women in terms of advocating for women uh, leadership in their organizations, but also in the sector. I think with that, I can pause there. Thank you, Annabelle. It was great to hear your ideas about how other organizations could take notice and begin their journey toward greater inclusion. Thank you very much for this presentation. Now I would like to yeah. introduce Julie. Julie will cover uh, how her utility has progressed gender equality in, in, and inclusion to a variety of different strategies, including consultation, result, resulting in changed working conditions. Julie will be presenting in Bahasa, so please use your interpretation option in the bottom of your screen uh, to hear the presentation in, in English if you need that translation. Thank you. Over to you, Julie. Terima kasih atas kesempatannya untuk IWA dan UTS untuk mempublikasikan kami, Tirta Sanjiwani, ke dunia internasional. Saya akan memaparkan mengenai perubahan-perubahan yang kami buat di dalam membuat kesan sesuai pepatah tak kenal maka tak sayang, saya akan menceritakan dengan jelas tentang siapa kami, Tirta Sanjiwani. Berikutnya, kami adalah perusahaan yang memproduksi, mendistribusikan, dan menjual air bersih terhadap sektor rumah tangga, sosial, komersial, dan industri, serta instansi pemerintah. Kami secara inklusif menyediakan kepada pelanggan kantor-kantor cabang di mana sesuai gambar di sebelah kanan Anda bisa melihatnya kita menyediakan kantor cabang di wilayah Dianyar, Tampak Siring, Sukawati, Blabato, Ubud, Tegalalang dan Payangan. Hal ini untuk memudahkan akses terhadap pelanggan agar pelayanan lebih cepat dan responsif. Ini adalah salah satu hal terkait dengan inklusi sosial. Berikutnya, pembelajaran yang bisa didapatkan di dalam webinar ini adalah kita mampu mengidentifikasikan gender dan kesenjangan yang ada di dalam sebuah perusahaan. Begitu juga dengan inklusinya. Yang kedua, kita bisa mengintervensi untuk lebih meningkatkan kesetaraan, inklusi, dan kesempatan. Dan bagaimana tantangan tipe-tipenya pada saat kita menghadapinya. Yang ketiga adalah kami di Tita Sanjiwani akan memberikan sebuah tindakan nyata kami berdasarkan data dan berdasarkan tindakan di tempat kerja kami. Di sebelah kanan bisa dilihat, ini adalah dokumentasi pembelajaran oleh mentor Yara Vale Water terhadap kami, di mana Yara Vale Water dalam program kemitraan selama tahun 2019 sampai 2021 menguatkan fondasi kita mengenai gender equality dan sosial inklusi yang sudah ada sebelumnya yang sudah ada pada kita sebelumnya, tapi lebih dikuatkan lagi dalam bentuk aksi. Berikutnya, visi dan janji layanan 
Tirta Sanjiwani. Visi dan, dan janji layanan sangat uh, mensimbolkan terhadap inklusi sosial. Jadi visi kami adalah terwujudnya pelayanan air minum yang menyeluruh dan berkesinambungan secara profesional berdasarkan Trihita Karana. Apa Trihita Karana? Adalah tiga kebaikan hubungan antara Tuhan, manusia, dan lingkungan atau alam semesta. Jadi janji layanan kami yang pertama adalah melayani masyarakat pelanggan dengan semboyan 5S. Senyum, sapa, sopan, santun, serius. Yang kedua, menyediakan air minum yang berkualitas kepada pelanggan secara berkesinambungan. Yang ketiga, memberikan respon yang cepat dan tepat terhadap setiap peluhan pelanggan, baik secara langsung maupun tidak langsung. Yang keempat, meningkatkan mutu kompetensi sumber daya manusia. Yang kelima, mengupayakan memproduksi air yang siap diminum pada daerah tertentu atau zona air minum prima. Yang keenam, siap selalu berkoordinasi dengan stakeholder, di mana perusahaan kami adalah milik pemerintah dan berada di tiga posisi best practice atau kinerja terbaik di Provinsi Bali dengan melibatkan 60.605 masyarakat pelanggan, sambungan langganan, dan memiliki 222 pegawai, di mana 56-nya adalah wanita, sehingga prosentasenya adalah 24,4 persen. Untuk kunci penting kesetaraan, kita memiliki sebuah progres di sini. Waktu awal pertama, kita hanya memberikan apa yang dibutuhkan oleh pegawai dan apa yang dibutuhkan oleh pelanggan. Saat mempelajari dan menguatkan Jesse, kita mencoba untuk sensitif dan lebih mengakomodasi, sehingga tidak perlu harus disuruh, tidak perlu tunggu sangat membutuhkan. Sampai sekarang, kita masih mulai terus belajar berbudaya untuk menuju transformatif mengenai Jesse. Itu adalah tahapan kami Tirta Sanjiwani. Cara kita mengidentifikasi hal penting adalah dengan mengurangi kesenjangan jumlah antara wanita dan laki-laki berdasarkan kualifikasi dan latar belakang masing-masing. Yang kedua, mengurangi kesenjangan antara kualifikasi di bidang teknik dengan di bidang administrasi, khususnya dalam ini adalah wanita, karena kita hidup di sektor air. Yang ketiga, kesetaraan dan kesempatan untuk dipromosikan sebagai middle management atau manajemen tengah dan high management berdasarkan kualifikasi kita dan tentunya tes terlebih dahulu. Kemudian selanjutnya kesetaraan untuk peningkatan keterampilan, manajemen, dan kepemimpinan bagi semua pekerja. Tidak ada satupun yang tertinggal. Jadi semua berhak mendapatkan pelatihan dalam satu tahun kinerja. Kemudian selanjutnya adalah peningkatan keselamatan, martabat, privasi, kesejahteraan, serta kebersihan bagi tenaga kerja secara merata tanpa memandang sebuah perbedaan sesuai peraturan yang berlaku, terutama mengenai ketenaga kerjaan. Yang terakhir, kita itu memiliki akses yang sama di antara semua pegawai untuk berkomunikasi, untuk menuangkan saran, untuk berbagi ilmu pengetahuan dan teknologi. Jadi, di sini aksi nyata kami adalah kita mencoba untuk polisi yang pertama, kebijakan yang pertama adalah mengarus utamakan Jetsi di bisnis plan kita agar diinput nantinya di tahun 2024 sampai 2028 secara redaksional. 
Yang kedua, dalam setiap perekrutan mengarus utamakan jetsi. Jadi ada pembelajaran, ada porsi wanita dan laki-laki, dan tidak membatasi pada saat permintaan untuk merekrut. Nomor tiga, transparansi dalam hasil tes untuk dipromosikan. Dan ini harus berbasis data yang bersumber dari sumber daya manusia, dari HRD, Human Resources Department. Yang keempat, kita sudah mengadakan survei untuk kepuasan pegawai yang digunakan sebagai literasi, sebagai dasar, acuan, saran, dan pendapat dari pegawai. Bisa didapatkan di tautan sebagai berikut. Nomor lima, kita terhubung bersama dengan jajaran direksi beserta karyawan dalam sebuah grup untuk berbagi informasi dan literasi digital. Langkah ini untuk menuju paperless, ya, untuk uh, kesinergisan menuju efisiensi energi. Untuk yang keenam, jadi ikatan internal kita, kita biasa mengadakan kegiatan sama-sama untuk membersihkan lingkungan kantor, terutama sumber-sumber produksi. Dan untuk eksternal bonding, ikatan eksternal, kita mengadakan kunjungan kepada karyawan yang tidak sehat dalam waktu lama, menghadiri undangan pada saat suka, dan juga mendukung pada saat duka, juga mensupport teman yang defable, mengalami disabilitas. Ini juga disupport dengan aturan internal mengenai bonding, ikatan ini. Berikutnya. Ini adalah contoh nyata bahwa berdasarkan gender, kita sudah dibagi porsinya rata, peran kita masing-masing dalam melakukan tugas di berbagai unit kerja, baik itu laki-laki maupun perempuan, bisa menghadiri training, pelatihan ini. Nah, Ini adalah critical area kritis kita untuk pegawai, jadi seperti dapat dilihat, di sini adalah kuota perempuan prosentasenya sampai saat ini kita bisa mempertahankan lebih dari 20 persen. Namun dengan nantinya dimasukkan ke rencana bisnis, harapan kami bisa melampaui hal tersebut. Kemudian sebagai kepala divisi, seperti posisi saya saat ini, kita berusaha mengupgrade-nya lebih dari 30 persen dan berusaha mempertahankannya. Untuk posisi manajer, ini adalah PR bagi kita, homework PR. Jadi pekerjaan yang memang harus masih terus digencarkan berdasarkan kualifikasi untuk mencari posisi wanita di manajer. Untuk technical staff dari kita sudah mengalami progres yang sangat baik. Jadi di tahun 2022 kita sudah mendapatkan pekerja di bidang teknik melebihi 20,45 persen. Slide berikutnya. Ini adalah contoh dari keakraban kita bersama. Jadi ikatan kita bagaimana kita membersihkan lingkungan kita secara internal mengadakan ikatan terhadap teman-teman yang di Pebble juga kita dengan sepenuh hati didampingi apapun pekerjaan itu, apa yang susah. Kemudian dari jajaran direksi juga sering mengadakan pertemuan seperti yang bisa dilihat di dalam gambar untuk mengakrabkan diri dengan karyawannya. Dan ini adalah kunjungan duka ke pegawai kita yang mengalami kesusahan. Ya, ini adalah langkah-langkah kita untuk uh, secara eksternal. Jadi fokus area kita untuk kunci supaya perusahaan uh, memang menandakan bahwa kita memegang teguh inklusi sosial. Yang pertama fokus kita adalah terhadap masyarakat pelanggan. Jadi 
semua terintegrasi ke public relation atau hubungan masyarakat, bagian divisi humas. Jadi segala informasi disertai dengan konten-konten yang menarik yang dapat menginformasikan ke pelanggan, baik itu media sosial, radio, maupun surat kabar. Jadi forum pelanggan kita secara digitalisasi bernama call center 24 jam kita responsif terhadap masyarakat pelanggan. Yang kedua adalah akses terhadap air bersih berlaku terhadap seluruh masyarakat Gianyar. Jadi kita memiliki kran umum, kemudian air juga untuk masyarakat berpenghasilan rendah, kemudian pelayanan truk tangki terutama untuk kondisi darurat. Banjir bandang akhir-akhir ini sangat membuat situasi di luar kontrol dari pelayanan kita, tapi dengan sigap teman-teman yang ada di lapangan, teman-teman teknik administrasi juga sangat membantu melayani masyarakat yang membutuhkan dengan pelayanan mobil tangki. Jadi saat ini Bali sedang dalam musibah, begitu banyak intensitas hujan, sehingga kami sangat siap 24 jam tiada henti untuk melayani masyarakat melalui mobil tangki. Nomor tiga, kami juga memproduksi dan mendistribusikan air minum dalam kemasan. Nomor empat, di sini kita melakukan kegiatan, terutama teman-teman yang di lapangan, untuk melakukan kunjungan fisik secara teratur, baik itu sosialisasi dampak, sosialisasi mengenai kebijakan, mengenai uh, pembayaran tagihan yang menunggak sehingga harus didekati secara persuasif. Jadi di sini terlihat di foto nomor 4 di sebelah kiri, teman-teman memberikan penjelasan terutama juga responsif terhadap pemeriksaan tapping-tapping yang bersifat ilegal. Jadi sering dilakukan kunjungan rumah ke masyarakat. Kemudian yang kelima, kita melakukan tanggung jawab sosial dan lingkungan atau biasa yang disebut corporate social responsibility ke berbagai uh, lapisan masyarakat. Kemudian yang keenam, kita melakukan survei terhadap pelanggan secara periodik teratur itu. Dan yang ketujuh, kerjasama dengan eksternal organisasi juga kita lakukan. Yang kelapan, kita selaku mentor di beberapa penyedia air lainnya terutama di Bali Timur dan beberapa lebih dari lima sudah dilakukan studi banding terhadap kita. Jadi kita uh, adalah selaku pemberi informasi mengenai bagaimana kinerja kita. Itu tadi adalah kunci penting uh, di dalam sosial inklusi kami dan ini adalah bukti-bukti keterlibatan kami semua uh, melibatkan pegawai kita yaitu mengkonservasi lingkungan, membersihkan lingkungan, memberikan pelatihan kepada siswa-siswa yang ingin mengetahui tentang bagaimana dunia kerja. Kita mendampingi dan bagaimana kegiatan agama kita juga memberdayakan perempuan di sini. Selaku perannya sebagai karir di tempat kerja, namun seimbang memberikan keterampilannya juga di luar tempat kerja. Ini adalah langkah lanjutan dari kami dan harapan kami adalah ketika penanganan skala prioritas berdasarkan anggaran, itu harus kami lakukan karena mengingat situasi kritis saat ini setelah pandemi, jadi sambungan rumah di kami ini mulai menurun. Jadi intensif kami lakukan dengan strategi pemasaran apapun, tapi tetap prioritasnya adalah internal budget atau anggaran internal dari kami harus sangat selektif. Kemudian keterlibatan dengan yang lain harus selalu ditingkatkan. Komitmen dari manajemen puncak ini harus diutamakan. Yang ketiga, kami dan manajemen puncak memang harus memiliki komitmen tinggi untuk mengarus utamakan jetsi di dalam bisnis plan-nya. Dan kami akan berusaha terus mengawalnya di tahun 2024 nanti agar seluruh program lebih maksimal terrealisasi. Untuk hibah berdasarkan kinerja 
dan capacity building atau peningkatan kapasitas yang harus utamakan Jesi di dalam program-program pemerintah nasional atau internasional untuk perusahaan di level kecil dan menengah di bidang water sector, di bidang air, harus selalu kita ikuti. Dan yang terakhir, lakukan kebaikan, meskipun itu tindakan kecil, tapi baik setiap hari, selalu utamakan bermanfaat untuk diri dan orang lain, dan tentunya perusahaan. Lakukan inovasi selalu tiap hari, apapun pekerjaan Anda. Terima kasih atas kesempatannya. Om Santi 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 Om. Thank you, Julie. It was wonderful to hear about the training for senior management on inclusion and the efforts such as inclusive recruitment processes to attract women and a more diverse workforce, particularly for technical roles. Thank you very much for this insightful presentation. I would like to now welcome Juliet. As mentioned, Juliet will present guidance on how to be more inclusive in all the employment stages of diagnosis, attraction, recruitment, retention, and advancement. She will also share an online database with strategies to improve workplace gender equality and inclusion. And she will also run a poll after that. Welcome, Juliet. Thank you, Sika. And thank you so much to, um, to Julie and to Annabelle for sharing your wonderful experiences, um, your personal stories, Annabelle, and Julie, the amazing things that your utility is doing. Um, we get the sense that it's inclusion, not just in the workforce, but also in everything you do as, as, a, as a water company, uh, which is wonderful to hear. So I will be um, sharing uh, research that was done through the Australian government's Water for Women Fund. And also part of this work was conducted in partnership with the World Bank Equal Aqua Initiative. Um, and the framework is how uh, we built on their framework um, in looking at the how to have strategies and a systematic approach to improving gender and inclusion in water and sanitation workplaces. So we've heard already why we need to address inclusion. The only point I'd like to add here is about everyone having a responsibility for this, uh, no matter who you are. And I think uh, Julie's note that making a good act every day, if each person made a good act every day, both women, men and other genders, uh, we can definitely create a more equal workforce and services. And I just want to also draw attention to that we can't only think about uh, gender uh, and inclusion from a narrow perspective. We have to also think about disability. We should think about class. We should think about ethnicity because there are different forms of disadvantage. And when we're trying to create inclusion, we should understand that there can be different forms of discrimination. So I will very, very briefly uh, provide the basis for the guidance and database that we developed. We first did research in both Cambodia and in Indonesia to understand what some of the gender equality issues were. And in our findings, they're very similar to what you've heard from Annabelle and from Julie. We used a framework that helped us think about individuals as well as systemic issues in society and to think about what happens informally in terms of individuals thinking or society's thinking, and also what happens in the formal realm in terms of resource allocation, in terms of rules and policies. In Indonesia, we found that women's career progression was restricted for many reasons. We found that although there was increasing acceptance of equality, there weren't formal affirmative policies that supported it. We found that women were very dependent on family support for their care roles. We found limited attention to gender-based violence. And we had found that even though there are policies um, and guidance on employing people with a disability, these were not yet put into action. And there is a quote here on the left that I think it speaks to Annabelle's point um, about uh, expectations of women. So we heard that women fear uh, showing their performance. There's a stigma of culture that they should be humble and not assert themselves or show their skills. 
and a bad stigma for their family if they're performing well. And I think that resonates with what you described, Annabelle, of um, if you do well, then people will say it, so that you're doing too much. And if you uh, don't do well, then you're also criticized. So women are placed in um, a very difficult position. But equally, we found men who were very, very supportive of increasing uh, women's promotions, uh, giving them leadership roles. So in Indonesia, we found that things were in transition. In Cambodia, we looked at what the five top barriers were for women to be involved in commune level governance and district level. We found it was a lack of leadership training. It was their family responsibilities. It was having less management experience. It was missing role models and that management was due, viewed as a man's job. And what we see on the left here, the quote was also the informal environment that women come into, um, which again, Annabelle described. Uh, this is a, a woman who joined a commune level uh, committee. And she said that when she came there, everyone was older, they drink wine, they smoke. And I fear I'm not getting close to them because I'm a woman. And sometimes they use bad words and treat me like a child and tease me um, and saying it's fun. It's they're not treating me badly, but I had to get used to it. So these are the kinds of experiences that women have when they're brought into a, a, a workplace that is more dominantly male. And it's something that we need to help address so that we can have more safe and inclusive workplaces. So we have many research outputs uh, from this research and I will later put a, in the chat the link for anyone who wants to read those. I will now move on to the framework. The framework covers very systematically five stages as well as societal expectations of the things that you can do and everyone can do in their organizations to create greater equality. For diagnosis, first we must understand what issues your organization is facing and we make sure that we are tailoring strategies to match those challenges. There are many tools such as GEDSI audits, pay gap assessments, there are international standards, there are scorecards. And later I will show a database of these kinds of tools that you can easily find. For attraction, here we need to make sure we're making the water and sanitation sector more attractive to a more diverse group of people. And there are many strategies we can use for this as well. Outreach programs, apprenticeship, we can have scholarships, we can have mentor programs. And you heard both Annabelle and Julie talk about some of these that they have already experienced or are using. For recruitment, we can take steps to eliminate discrimination, even sometimes unintended discrimination in recruitment processes so and also encourage more diverse participants. And here we can rephrase job advertisements, we can make sure staff are trained on recruitment procedures, we can have quotas or hiring incentives. For retaining women and more diverse workforce, we need to consider both the informal dynamics, which is about how different people in a workplace participate, how they communicate with one another, what support is given, as Annabelle described, of different leadership styles. And then there is the formal policies that we need to make sure that we are supporting women and more, more diversity. And this is then about um, ensuring that maternity leave facilities, etc., are available to make sure that people's different people's needs are met. Lastly, advancement, training, mentorship, networking, supporting leadership promotion and career advancement. Again, there are many strategies which can be used to help advancement of more diverse people and women in particular in water and sanitation workplaces. But we shouldn't forget that all of this takes place and every organization sits within a wider society and the values and norms of that society affect how that organization functions. And we should note that sometimes discrimination or the way people think, it's, in, it's a little bit invisible because we were brought up with it um, from, from early years. Sometimes we don't question uh, 
how things are and we don't realize that maybe people are being discriminated against. And so there are many strategies also to, to look beyond an organization, not just in an organization to help shift those and to be more aware of them. So from here, I'm going to ask people to have a look at the database that we have formed. So I've put in the chat a link to this database. So you need to click on this link or you can use the QR code please use the QR code or please use the link in the chat because we want to help you access this database and make it easy for you to navigate it and find these many strategies you can use. So click on the link and then you will find, if you scroll down, you will see this database with the green and white and click on the blue download icon and you will download, it will download an Excel spreadsheet and after that once you're in the spreadsheet you will find that there are a menu where you can filter and there are two ways you can filter to find the strategies that are useful to you you can filter according to the stage that i just described whether you want to find about, out about diagnosis tools or retention or advancement and you can choose whether you want to look at strategies that are for disability inclusion or for gender equality. And you click on whichever filters you want. And you then move across to the tab where it says activities. And here you can then look in the database and it will come up with different strategies. We give information about the type of strategy, the organization that did it. You'll find many, many from the water sector and also beyond, and you'll find a URL. So I will stop here. I really encourage you to look at the database and I will hand back to Sika now to move to the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliet, for sharing these very valuable resources. They're much needed resources that can help institutions to start or progress on their journey to gender diversity, inclusion and equity. Thank you for that. Hopefully the resources that Juliet shared will be useful for attendees and will be used. Now we can go to our Q&A session uh, where um, our attendees can ask questions all of our speakers. I'll invite all of our panelists to come on camera so we can see them. We have a few questions. Um, to our panelists, and I will start with um, one for Annabelle. Annabelle, you won the IWA Gender and Diversity Award in 2022, which is a wonderful recognition of your contribution. Congratulations. What is your proudest achievement is this, in this regards? I, I think for me, um, it is that recognition of uh, you know, the work that is done. I actually also discovered that uh, on the day that uh, we were, you know, on 20th, we had what we call our Heroes Day. And uh, I saw on, on Monday, that was, that was on Thursday. And then on Monday, there were all those uh, women who are being listed in one of the newspapers as having made a great uh, challenge, a, a great, um, um, who have contributed, you know, greatly to, 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 to different development activities. And, uh, my photo was there, I didn't even know. So I just got some people sending me the photo and saying that, uh, oh yeah, this is one of them. Uh, this is something that we have found that you actually won this award and that there's also recognition of other things that you have done. And I think like I said uh, in the past is that uh, it is quite an amazing thing because uh, you work in this sector and uh, you are you're rebelling too much, especially on gender. Sometimes you think that there is not much that is being recognized, but even that just, the recognition, uh, it just uh, shows that uh, there is uh, a lot of changes that are actually happening in this uh, area of gender in our country, which I think for me is quite positive. Like uh, uh, Julie said, there is quite a lot that is happening also in Kenya, whereby we find that the numbers are now beginning to change, which I think I do appreciate. Uh, the fact that uh, there has been a lot of support both from uh, the water utilities in Kenya, but also from the water sector in terms of just uh, including gender and this, you know, positive response. So I think for me, that is what I would say. Thank you, Annabelle. Thank you for answering this question. 
Next question is for Julie. Uh, it was inspiring to hear about your organization effort to accommodate JETC consideration and recruitment processes. What was the key enabling factor that initi initiated or triggered this change? Yeah, pertanyaannya untuk saya, betul? Jika? Yes. Ya. Yeah. Untuk mendukung perubahan, uh, masalah tantangan kita yang paling besar adalah di budget atau biaya. Sehingga untuk mendukung seluruh program JC, kita saat ini mengutamakan kapasitas building dan inovasi dari masing-masing orang yang memegang kebijakan. Jadi cara paling utama dan efektif selain mengutamakan biaya untuk sebuah fasilitas besar seperti desain universal untuk toilet, kita lebih mengencourage artinya memberdayakan seluruh sistem yang ada dengan tetap memasukkan kunci-kunci penting sebagai penyemangat bahwa kita dengan minim biaya kita bisa untuk menginklusi baik pegawai maupun masyarakat pelanggan. Jadi inovasi yang kita lakukan ini adalah lebih ke kapasitas building, tapi dengan komitmen bersama dari direksi terutama bahwa anggaran tahun depan kita akan menciptakan sebuah gedung baru yang melengkapi seluruh kebutuhan teman-teman di sana. Bahwa kita ini memiliki bangunan gedung yang terpisah-pisah dan masih belum ada fasilitas khusus untuk teman-teman disabilitas. Dan ini memerlukan begitu besar budget, begitu besar biaya. Sehingga untuk tahun krisis ini, kita mengenakan skala prioritas. Seperti itu yang terjadi pada perusahaan kami. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for your response. Uh, there's also a question for Juliet. Uh, what advice do you have for, for an, an organization that is just starting to think about gender and diversity? Where should they start? Great. Thank you, Sika. Uh, so I would say that the starting point is um, from the leadership. Um, that's the ideal place to begin is either if you are a leader to take action or if you are an employee at any other level, start to access your existing leaders because leadership of a cultural change within an organization is very, very important and can also help protect people against the kind of backlash that Annabelle described earlier. So leadership is an important starting point. And my second uh, suggestion is to start with that diagnosis step that I explained from the framework. Each organization is different. There will be different experiences of different employees. And first, you must find out about your organization and make sure you understand what the issues are that different genders have experienced in that organization. And from all different levels, from all different ages, you need to understand the diversity and use some of the existing tools or your own tools. You can make your own tools. You can interview um, different people in the organization. That's something that we did in our own organization in the last two years. We did an exploration. And the third thing you must do is follow through. Once you've revealed and made visible some of the problems, you can't just ignore them. You, you've, they've been surfaced, they're visible, and then there must be actions and follow through. And this is why the leadership is important because to have action and follow through, you need the leadership on board to help make changes. So those would be my suggestions, Sika. Thank you, Juliet, for your valuable advices. This is much appreciated. And uh, I also have a question from Diana, uh, our fourth panelist. Uh, Diana, please um, feel free to um, put a bit of a background uh, if you want to with a couple of sentences. And the question to you is, how can a water supply and sanitation company incorporating gender inclusion uh, in its work while undergoing a transformation journey? Moreover, why is the utility prioritizing this while many other urgent issues can become competing matters? Over to you, Diana. Thank you very much, Sika, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss. Um, the need for gender inclusion um, in our workplaces cannot be overemphasized. 
we, we are dealing with various challenges as we provide services. And we realize that if we have to make improvements, we cannot just focus on the, 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 the hardware or the infrastructure. There's need for us to have inclusivity. Uh, to, it requires a, a holistic approach that tackles all the, the wider issues that um, uh, help us to sustain the services that we provide. Uh, at Kano Water, um, I am uh, the first female uh, MD in the water sector among 11, so it is quite clear that there's less uh, representation of women indeed in water supply and, and, and sanitation. And in our utility, there's a ratio of uh, 76, 74 to 26%, 74 male and 26% female, which underscores the fact that there's less uh, representation uh, of women. So as a leader who is female and promoting gender uh, uh, inclusion, I think we have ensured that we have a, a policy in place, a gender policy that helps us to ensure that uh, we, we take care of both gender, male, female, but of course also promoting more of the women so that we create a balance in the manner in which we carry out our recruitments, in the manner that we carry out our manpower uh, development uh, programs. And even as we carry out projects, we realize that for, for WASH, we have to also look at the institutions that are implementing and the communities where we are working. And we involve women in making sanitation platforms as part of the programs that we implement. We involve programs to support uh, menstrual hygiene for, we, for girls in schools. Um, we're happy actually to be part of the utility of the future program. Uh, this is a transformation program for the World Bank that's helping us to, to transform and improve uh, our capacities, the utility of the future. This is really to, to, to be able in this rapidly changing world to achieve success. And we realize that it's not just for the operational managerial governance factors, we need innovation, we need inclusion, we need to be resilient and we need business continuity. And through the utility of the future program is helping us to achieve this uh, continuous improvement by ensuring that we strengthen our capacities as a utility, the essential processes of the utility so that we face the current challenges and achieve uh, future thinking. And what I want to share here is the fact that it is clear that we need inclusion. We need to ensure that there's the ability to, to, to have all the, the people, uh, both male and female disadvantaged, everybody as part of the society is included so that it also boosts on their dignity, improves livelihood in communities. So there we are focusing on gender balance, gender diversity, and we are also ensuring that we update our gender policy to keep it up to date with also what's going on uh, with the changes in the, in the environment. And uh, we are also looking at how do we promote networking? How do we create a conducive work environment that also takes care of the women? How do we ensure resources are provided that also promote gender equity within the organization to be able to undertake uh, the various programs? We're also promoting networking, part of the women, African Women Sanitation Professionals Network, and also promoting most of the women to be able to be part of this networking process. This is how we are uh, helping to ensure that we, we accelerate in terms of inclusion on, on gender, mentorship programs, and all the various programs that are going to help have all aspects of the organization taken care of. Thank you, Sika. Thank you, Diana, for the great insight and contributions to the to our discussion today, much appreciated. Uh, and now I have a final panel closing question to all of our panelists. I'll kindly ask you all to answer just with one or maximum two sentences. And the question is, what is your biggest piece of advice to an organization looking, looking to become more inclusive? 
Thank you. Maybe we can start the same order with Annabelle, followed by Julie, and then Juliet, and then Diane. Yeah, thank you. I think for me, uh, for an organization to become uh, inclusive, I think it is very important for uh, organization to ensure that uh, they have very good data and information that they're going to use uh, to convince uh, their management and the rest of the people that we have a real gender issue that needs to be addressed, uh, which is what has been uh, lacking for a long time. And then ensuring that uh, we have practical steps that we are, we, we are recommending that should be taken up immediately by the institutions. And that is because uh, in majority of the cases in the past, I, we provided solutions, but then we didn't say exactly what needed to say. So we said there's a problem here, but then we had no practical like solution that we were proposing to be undertaken. Yeah. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Julie. Ya, terima kasih atas pertanyaannya. Bahwa perusahaan harus inklusi adalah berdasarkan data. Saya sepakat dengan Ibu Annabel. Jadi kita mengadakan survei terhadap pegawai kita, terhadap pelanggan kita, itu adalah satu langkah yang paling inklusif. Jadi itu adalah strategi. Yang pertama, kita harus berdasarkan data. Dan yang kedua, data jumlah akan membedakan gender masing-masing. Tapi meskipun dengan peran yang sama, artinya kita respect dengan uh, pekerjaan kita. Tapi kita dibedakan atas peran kita. Itu yang harus dijelaskan dalam sebuah rapat internal, eksternal, berupa konten-konten yang mengutamakan Jesse. Itu sebagai langkah strategis. Nah, bagaimana caranya mengingatkan pimpinan kita? Sama seperti yang tadi diutarakan, pada saat rapat, kita harus memiliki tim-tim solid yang vokal terhadap JC. Ini jangan sampai dilupakan. Jadi ketika kebijakan pimpinan kita tidak mengarus utamakan, ada tim-tim yang memang sensitif, yang memang mengakomodasi, ada tim-tim terutama di penelitian dan pengembangan yang membudayakan transformasi itu supaya menjadi peka dan transformatif terhadap JC. Terima kasih. Thank you very much, Julie. Juliet, do you have a comment and any answer of this question as well? Thank you. Yes, yes. And that is to say that I agree with Julie and Annabelle on the need for, for data and convincing data to get started. But this should not just be a once event. It's something we must then monitor over time, how things change. And we also must check what are people's experiences and check for opposition, check for backlash, check that there are not negative and unintended consequences of making these changes as an organization evolves. So that's my main piece of advice to think it's not something you just do once and then it's done. This is something you commit to for the long term and you must keep monitoring and understanding how things are going, which things are going well, which things there may still be challenges so that you're constantly responding to the changes as the organization evolves. Thank you, Sika. Thank you very much, Juliet. Diana, do you have an insight on that question that you want to share with us? Uh, thank you so much. Um, it is important that we have the policies in place, the programs that guide our policies, and then we make sure we have a clear implementation plan I think in our case, we have a committee that's spearheading that so that we are indeed checking on how we are progressing. Um, when I talked about the statistics for our company, we've seen that we've made progress at senior management level where we have 57% for female, uh, female and 43% male. So we, we need to be able to continuously uh, improve and be able to as much as possible, uh, keep tracking how we are performing on the gender side and ensuring that it has the necessary support in terms of leadership and resources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. And thank you to all our panelists for your insights and all you've shared with our audience. 
this information is much appreciated. The journey towards gender diversity and inclusion can be a rewarding one, whilst they are challenging along the way for both individuals and organization. Ultimately, the evolution towards greater diversity and greater inclusion helps strengthen us um, in a personal, professional, and organizational level. The water sector will be better equipped to deliver services that meet the needs of all if we ensure the workforce makeup reflects the diversity of the communities that need and benefit from the water and sanitation services. There are numerous opportunities across all aspects of the employment cycle to take action. And we hope that this session has inspired you to pursue these uh, strategies in your workforce. We'll close with a final poll, and we hope that you've enjoyed this session and would like to hear about your level of, of motivation to make changes in your organization. The final post question is, how motivated do you feel to make changes in your workplace? Very motivated, somewhat motivated, little motivated or not motivated at all? It would be great to share your opinion on that after hearing our webinar and our panelists. I encourage all attendees to answer this question, please. I think we can now end the poll. I think most people who wanted to participate already did. Uh, what I can see here is that the bigger percentage, 53% of our attendees are very motivated um, to make changes in their workforce, which is, which is brilliant. Um, also 45% uh, somewhat motivated and only 3% um, of our attendees answer that they're only little motivated. Uh, I'm very glad to see that there's no participant who, um, who answered that is not motivated at all. Hopefully this, um, this was insightful session helping for um, participants to find the way to get their journey going. There's, and you've been given some food for thoughts we have long way to go in achieving gender equality, diversity and inclusion, but hopefully this is, this is a little step towards that. Thank you very much to everyone who joined us and have a good day or good evening, depending where you just wanted to show uh, to share some information about the upcoming events of IWA. Uh, we are having an IWA Digital Water Summit in Bilbao, Spain, um, between 28th, 29th of November and 2nd of December this year. Uh, you can find some information in IWA website. So we are having an upcoming web webinar, the future, the future of disinfection in drinking water and wastewater, coming on the 9th of November. You can also find information uh, on IWA website. For new um, joinees as a members of IWA, uh, we have a 20% discount, discount code for membership that um, is valid until 31st of December 2022. Uh, and you need to use the code WEB22 recruits, the one that is on your screen. And for more information, refer to our website again. Thank you once again to everyone. Take care. Bye. <laughs>